obviously, one of the questions that is always brought up would be, why do you need to see a pediatric neurologist? I'm not sure I can answer that question for you, but I can at least give you some guidelines. And one of the things I was going to try to do here, we can find this slide, but in your handout, you'll see that there is It is um, the guidelines as outlined by the um, American Academy of Neurology, which is really the Child Neurology Society guidelines. Uh, in any event, the idea here is that there are a reasonable number of uh, concepts about brain development that are uh, associated with things like metabolic disorders and structural disorders of the brain. And yes, we have screening. So what the child neurologist is supposed to do is to be the expert in screening for these disorders. Um, obviously, I would expect that all pediatricians be aware of these disorders. So the things that are now being obviously recommended would be a flow chart type of diagram where obviously obtaining a detailed history and examination of the child would be the first thing. And I would hope that that would be on your list as well. Part of that should be monitoring head growth. And believe me, the head growth chart ends up being one of the most important pieces of your examination when you start evaluating a child with developmental delay. The hearing and vision evaluations, now I have my own personal bias that actually the family is going to be the best screening tool there. Uh, the mother can tell you whether the child sees or hears. Now screening is also very important, so obviously evaluations are important, but I think it's also important to just ask the question. Mom, does the child see, does the child hear, are there any concerns that you have? The metabolic screening is a very interesting problem and it came up um, recently because of the fact, uh, obviously newborn screening now has escalated. There's a lot more that's being done and if good newborn screening has been done, you don't have to do more. And in fact, many of the nurseries now are doing a lot of chromosome screening. But those results are never gotten by the pediatrician. You don't know. So obviously, there needs to be better communication. We need to find out what sort of screening was done in the newborn period and make sure we know the results. If that screening has been done properly, further screening is really not necessary. Now, the other thing is really getting a good history about possible seizure events. And that's an important thing, and this is becoming a more interesting problem when we call them paroxysmal events. And obviously, that's where a good pediatric neurologist can help you out, is to try to determine first if these are really significant events, and then second, whether they need to be treated. Now, the other level here is this idea of the family history. The family history is going to be a very important thing. Obviously, if there is already a tendency for significant developmental problems running in the family, that's a big red flag. Has it already been checked out? Has there already been extensive genetic evaluations of a family member? We need to accumulate that data. Obviously, if there is a known disease running in the family, that needs to be checked on. Now, just uh, as an interesting sidelight on that, <coughs> there is now um, what we call the whole genome and mitochondrial assay. Uh, there's a whole 
incredible array of tests that can be done. This is actually um, an advertisement from a company from Houston, Texas. And for $1,600, they will do a screening of 270 genetic syndromes, 41 unique subtelomeric regions and 43 unique peri-centromeric. So you get all of these very fascinating genetic assays for $1,600. And there is an enormous amount of genetic testing that can be done. Now when it needs to be done, that's a whole other question. I'm not sure I can even answer that. Now there are two other things that I just want to talk about real quickly, and that would be the use of the EEG. Obviously, there's an important point that I would make out, and that is that just doing an EEG is not useful. Obviously, it needs to be interpreted by someone who knows what they're looking at. And it needs to be performed by a laboratory that knows how to do it on children. Fortunately, in this community, we have me. <clears throat> I interpret all of the pediatric EEGs. And we have at least two labs that are excellent at doing children, and that would be the St. John's Hospital and Ventura County Medical Center. Some of the adult neurologists who try to do it in their little offices, forget it. It's a useless study. But in the hands of a good technician and somebody who knows how to interpret it can be a very useful tool to assist with making judgments about whether the child's having seizure-like events or whether there's an underlying disorder of the brain. The other topic that I want to talk about is in neuroimaging. Uh, the recommendations, as you'll see um, in the guidelines, is that neuroimaging is recommended. And clearly, it's something that is an important consideration, but often very difficult to obtain. Now, obviously, sedation is going to be necessary, and so oftentimes neuroimaging with sedation, and for MRIs, it's a substantial thing. Sometimes it's even general anesthesia. Now, is that risk worth it? I'm not sure that's a really good, uh, uh, well, let's say, risk to take with some of these children. So it's something that we have to keep into consideration. I think that fortunately, most of our good CT scanners are adequate for most screening. So a relatively straightforward non-contrast CT scan is usually the best initial screen. And these things, even a referral for an EEG or a CT scan, are reasonable to obtain even before a pediatric neurology consultation. In fact, it's always nicer to have the data in hand when I evaluate the child. Now, what's important from a pediatric neurology point of view is that uh, oftentimes I am given the responsibility for making a diagnosis for which then the child will be referred to CCS or even regional centers kind of waiting to see what the pediatric neurologist diagnoses on this child. I don't think that's fair. Obviously, I'm willing to make an independent judgment about what I see, and it may be that, no, I don't really think this child has cerebral palsy. But I think this kid has definite disorganization of the brain, but I'm not sure how to label it just yet. Well, okay, that may not help in obtaining services, but I think we can also work around that, because I think what we have to do is to talk about, uh, let's say, the uh, real operational assessment of the child versus a label to obtain services. And those may be totally uh, different. I'm not sure that's a topic for discussion today, but it's just something that I think is an important point. 